I'm Anna. And I'm Fran. And you're listening to Murder Words. Hey guys. So, we have a crazy story for you this week. Um, I hope you listened to that Mm two-parter that we just had. That was super crazy. If you haven't listened to it, go back and do that. Um, Also, we are working on our website right now. That should be up and running soon. Hopefully by the time this episode releases. Right. It should be up and running. (laughs) Um, And we are still working on masks. And, um, you know, go find us on Facebook and Instagram and and all that. Um, Also, if you have any... Um, recommendations on stories you want us to cover or just have like stories of your own please email us or like message us on social media mm-hmm. murder words podcast at gmail.com we love when people give us recommendations yeah, we love suggestions especially if like they're they know the case and they've been personally affected or it's like in their town we really like cases like that yeah we like to cover i mean of course they're known but you know, we like to cover the cases that are a little bit less known. Mm-hmm. We do co- we do plan on covering, like... Major serial killers. Yeah, yeah. Dahmer and BTK, like, we're waiting on those. But we just kind of want to wait until we have more mm-hmm. more listeners. And by mm-hmm. the way, we do have a Belgium listener that has downloaded all of our episodes. Yes. So if you could just comment on our Facebook or reach out to us because we would love to meet you because we get excited about you being a listener. (laughs) One person from Belgium, you know you are. (laughs) Okay, so the story that I'm covering tonight, this one like messed me up when I was doing research on it. I was like, this is just like something out of a movie that you don't even like really. And I, I had like heard bits and pieces, but I didn't know this whole story. And it's, it is crazy. It's also, um, like, super graphic. It has a lot of, like, sexual abuse. And if you're claustrophobic, I do not recommend. Oh. (laughs) So, this story is um, about a woman named Colleen Stan. She's really known as the woman in the box. Oh. That's what... This already sounds terrible. Yeah. So... Um, there are documentaries on her and, um, things like that. So, and it's actually called The Girl in the Box. So, um, Colleen Stan, she grew up in Riverside, California. Her mother was a citrus grower. Citrus? Which I thought was, like, so cute. Um, so she grew up in the orange groves, like, out in California, just, just during that, like, can you imagine just, like... Surrounded by orange trees all the time. Yeah, just, like, in California, just, yeah. Um, she had two sisters... Her parents were divorced, um, but, you know, as far as I could see, like, her mom and dad were still, like, she would stay with her mom throughout the week and go to her dad's on the weekend. So they were civil. Yeah, they were civil. Um, But her stepdad, there seemed to be some issues with her stepdad. I was watching an interview with her, and um, she said, like, she was described as, like, a free spirit and someone who was, like, super creative, like, to write poetry and love to be outside. I could see with all the citrus trees. Yes. And I would see that, too. Creativity. Um, but there was some talk that uh, she she would like to stay outside a lot so she could kind of escape her stepdad. Oh. Just because he was terrible and just didn't like children. So they kind of, you know, just try, try to stay away from him. So, and because of that, she eventually did move in with her dad. When she was a senior in high school, she met this guy, and they fell in love, and she decided to drop out, and they got married. That's quick. Yes, it was very quick. That's very quick. (laughs) And so was the marriage, because it lasted about a year. Oh. And after that ended, um, she decided to move back home. When she was back home, I mean, this was in the 70s. Too. Okay, that's what I was going to ask, like, when 70s, the time period was. Okay. So it was, like, hippie period, and Ooh. Um, I feel like I would have really enjoyed that time. You would have thrived. Yeah. Yes. Um, but when she moved back home, she was, I don't want to say miserable, but she wanted, more, like, she wanted to go out and see the world. Mm-hmm. And, um, she really didn't have any long-term goals. She just wanted to, like, live in the moment. Yeah. And, you know. She wanted to be young for yeah. a little bit, which is totally understandable. Yes. So, her and a couple of her friends moved to Eugene, Oregon. Um, So, like I said, this was 
the seventies and they hitchhiked a lot. Like she didn't have a vehicle. Mm -hmm. That was kind of normal back then. Yeah. Uh, can you literally imagine? Can, I can't imagine just walking out into the road and just putting my thumb up. I listen, <laughs> I, like, I picked up a hitchhiker once. Um, and like, you could have died. Stop it. That's what my mom said. She was very upset and she found out because the guy I actually picked up because it was like snowing. There was like 10 feet of snow. I could see a vehicle broke down like down the road. So I knew That's he was like walking. Stop it. So <laughs> like it turned out that this guy actually worked at the same place my mom worked and he told her about it. And I was like, like saying like what a nice person I was, and and then I got caught. <laughs> she was so upset. She was so mad. I don't blame her. Yeah, I get I it. I would be mad too. <laughs> but yeah, back then, you know, it was normal. So on May nineteenth, nineteen seventy seven, Colleen decided that she was going to surprise one of her friends for her birthday. Um, no one you know, really thought anything of it. She was like, I'm going to hitchhike down here and, you know, surprise her. It was like in Northern California. Okay. where her friend was. So she hitchhiked her way to a city called Red Bluff and then headed east on Highway 36. So she still had about 100 miles to go. Oh, my God. Yeah. So she stood there for about 20 minutes. The first offer for a ride was a car full of men, like younger men. And she was like, mm, no, thank you. Like, <laughs> I know, like, I'm a good judge of character. I'm not getting in the car with all these men. Um, she knew that was a terrible idea. So, you know, they drove off. And then another couple stopped by and she told them where she was trying to go. And they were like, we're not really going to go that far. So, sorry. And they went, they went on. She stood there about another 10 minutes and a blue Dodge Colt pulled up. It was a young couple in it with a baby. So, and they were like, yeah, we're heading that way. So, I mean, that's going to be, I mean, anyone would be like, oh, there's a baby in there. Like, it looks non-threatening. Yeah, this is non-threatening. Yes. Like, I'm going to go with the baby one. I'm surprised at the rate of people that stop. Like, every 10 minutes, someone stops. Yes. That's crazy. Like, people are just, like, picking up, just like it was normal. Mm -hmm. I can't get someone to say that hide me on the street. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'll be like, hello. I, and, that's usually, I'm like, don't make eye contact with anyone. I'm the, I'm the opposite. I'm like, hello. And they're, like, <laughs> walking to the other side of the road. I'm like. Okay. Yeah, it's so, like, it's just so different. And, like, they don't even have, f I mean, just think about it. Like, you're just, they can't text you. No. And be like, hey, I'm in the car with, so like, you know how you go yeah. to places and you send me your location? Yeah. It's just not a thing back then. It's crazy to me, yeah. Like, yeah. whenever I go in any kind of sketchy situation, I'm like, here, Anna, here's my location. Because I don't, Because I don't make <laughs> it dies. out. Yeah, I know where <laughs> she was. So, the couple in the car... Were Cameron and Janice Hooker. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. A, so a little background on them. Cameron was born November 5th, 1953 in Alturas, California. I probably said that wrong. Mm. I couldn't really find a lot about his childhood. Um, from like his parents were described as like normal. It seemed like a happy household. They moved around like a ton and then finally settled down in the city of Red Bluff when he was 16. So he has literally no excuse of why. I imagine no he's going to turn out terrible. Right. Yeah. He has no excuse that we know of. Like, right. Like so it was kind of hard to find, but, you know, everything seemed normal from what I read. So he, you know, he was 16 when he moved there. He graduated a high school and immediately started working at a lumber company. He met Janice the next year. When they met, she was only 15. Janice, her childhood was, was different. It was, like, super abusive. And, like, I read something that said when she was younger, she suffered from epilepsy. Oh. And her dad wouldn't go around her because he thought she was possessed. That's so sad. So she just is going to naturally try to seek that validation right. from and, someone. And she probably thinks she's possessed. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, like That part doesn't come back up. I just thought it was... It's really interesting, like, though. Interesting. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I don't know what, she, what they She knew thought something was dark it. inside her because her dad kept telling her that, probably. Yeah. So, they got married on January 18th, 1975. And they were described from, like, the community as well-liked and average like nothing really stood out and you know good or bad about them they were just i don't think i'd like being described as average i don't either like that. i'd be upset about that <laughs> <I would> too <laughs> the good news is i do not think we're average okay cool I, I'm, we 
sit around and talk about murder. Okay, that's time. cool. I'm all right so. with it. I mean, it's like a little bit of a negative image. Yeah. It's better than average. <laughs> yeah, so Cameron was apparently like super quiet, um, had worked at, like it still works at that job this whole time. Okay. So like stable, just quiet, like a normal dude. Janice, um, she was the type of mother who sewed, crocheted, and entertained their friends. More knitting. More knitting. More innocent there knitting. There's so much knitting in our stories. Colleen wasn't in the vehicle long before she started to get kind of a weird vibe. Like, she noticed that Janice was being, like, a little bit jumpy. And every time that Colleen would, like, look up in the rearview mirror, Cameron would be, like, staring at her. Like she was prey? Like they weren't even talking. And he was just, like, staring at her in the rearview mirror. Uh, yeah, like he was, like, checking her out. and That's awful. Yeah. I don't like that. So she felt super uncomfortable, obviously. And, but, like, her mind kept telling her, like, just let it go. They're being nice. They're giving me a ride. Like, maybe yeah. I'm just overreacting. And they kept asking her all kinds of questions, like, where are you going? Where are you from? And she told them, like, I'm going to surprise one of my friends. They're not expecting me. Oh, no. I know. So, um, which you wouldn't really think about something like that. Right. Until you think back, like... You know what I mean? But that's what they were really asking. You should be like, I'm meeting my brother cop. <laughs> I am meeting an officer, a bodyguard. A bodyguard. <laughs> Trained in martial arts, so. <laughs> so they ended up stopping for gas and Colleen went into the restroom. She had like a super weird experience in there. Like she talks about this in her interview. She said she was in the bathroom and like this voice was telling her, that she, she looked over and saw a window. That she needed to jump out that window, run, and never look back. And, like, she was thinking to herself, like, no, why, that's, I'm overreacting. Like, why would I do that? And she walked out of the bathroom and got back in the car. Clearly a decision. She's, look, she ignored her intuition. Forever. Yep, she ignored her intuition. Yeah. Although, thinking back again. Yeah, like, she was just trying to get to her friend's house. When she got back in the car, she noticed there was a box next to her on the seat. And she was thinking, like, okay, whatever. They just, you know, got something on the back. No big deal. Just a box. And she kind of blew past it. And they asked her if it was okay if they went and checked out the ice caves. He had mentioned before, like, his brother talked about there were ice caves in the area. And, you know, they wanted to go see him. In California, there's ice caves? I, <laughs> listen, I don't know. Okay, um. I just want to Google later if there's actually I should have Googled that. I don't know. There's ice caves here. So he, he asked her, like, do you mind if we make, like, a pit stop and go see the ice caves? Like, we were planning on doing it anyway. So, you know, is it a big deal? And she was like, I can't say no. Like, you know, they're giving me a ride. So, sure, we can stop and see the ice caves. She thought it was weird, though, because she never saw any signs for ice caves for ice caves in california yeah she like she was starting to feel like a weird you know something weird was going on they started going up into the mountains where no one was around so she's trying to look around and see what's going on they pull the car over turn it off and get out the husband and wife get out not her she's sitting in there like what is happening like am i supposed to get out they didn't really say anything She's starting to get nervous because she sees no caves around them. Like, there are zero ice caves. There's zero ice caves. So she's looking over, and she notices Janice and the baby were, like, down playing in a little creek. And all of a sudden, Cameron jumps into the back seat with her and holds a knife to her throat. He grabbed her hands and threw them behind her back and handcuffed her. And then, like, pushed the knife into her throat and said, Are you going to do what I tell you to do? And she was like... Yes, and then he gagged her. In this picture of this gag, I'm going to post it because it's like none other. It's like goes around the back of her head. It comes down like almost on top of her eyes. It looks like it's homemade or just like really, really old. Like a torture really old thing day. from later. Yeah, and then he like cinched it up underneath of her chin. So she just like literally couldn't do anything with her face. Ugh. Yeah, so, I mean, it was basically a head constraint. So this man, like, planned some things with this. Oh, yeah. Like, you like, just don't he, carry he that around ready. with you. Yeah, this was all planned out. He took her and laid her down on the seat, put her head, that box, it was like a 
it, it's like a head box. He put her head in the box and like closed it and locked it and then covered her with her own sleeping bag. What? Yes. So literally in this box, I'm going to post a picture of the box too, because this is like, obviously the girl in the box is a theme throughout this. So I just can't imagine like, that makes me like gasp for air. The pure terror of that. Yeah. Like just being, I mean, it's kind of small too. So it's like, I don't know. Like it's yeah, not like there's just no, no room. You don't know what I couldn't imagine. So was there like eye holes in it no. or anything it was just a plain box it was a wooden box just with a hole for a head had, it opened and like had little dips where the neck would go and he put it on her head and locked it so it was like on her oh my gosh yeah, like there was no yeah so she could hear janice and the baby get back in the car and like say nothing like act like it was no big deal she said in her interview that she remembers thinking, like, this lady knew the whole time and did mm-hmm. nothing. Like, she knew what was happening and did nothing. And you would think a mother was, like, yeah, more practical, like, protect someone. Gonna, yeah. yeah. They drove around for hours. They were waiting until it got dark because they couldn't take her in their house, like, in the middle of the daylight. Like, someone would notice this girl with a box on yeah. her head. She said that, she, like, it was so hot she was gasping for air inside of that box. She was listening, like she was starting to pay attention. She knew that they were back in the city because she could hear all the cars and traffic and right. things like that. So they finally stopped and Cameron took the box off of Colleen's head and took her into his house. She could see like the laundry room, the kitchen, and then he started to walk her down into a basement. Oh no. He, this gets like so graphic and crazy. He stood her up on top of another box what took the handcuffs off of her like strapped her wrists to chains that were hanging from the ceiling cut her clothes off and pulled the box she was standing on out from underneath of her so she was hanging from the ceiling naked oh my god yeah so he really really planned this yes he has like a torture chamber in his house he then started to whip her with a bull whip and once all of that was over, Cameron and Janice started to have sex underneath of her. Yes. Uh, uh. She was blindfolded, so she couldn't really see around her. Um, but she, you know how when you're blindfolded, you can like see out of the bottom and stuff. Right. She was trying to look around and she noticed like a table that had magazines all over it. And it was open to a page where a woman was naked and hanging from the ceiling. So it was like all of these things were just like the start of, I don't want to even say manipulating because that's not even a strong enough word, but like um, grooming her. Yes. To like think this was normal and almost be okay with it. Right. After they were done having sex, he took her down from the ceiling, put her head back into the box, and then shoved her into a crate from the neck down. And he attached her hands and feet to hooks on the inside. Maybe not hooks. That's like two restraints. Right. That were okay. On the inside. Oh, that's gross. Yeah. So she started to panic, obviously. Like all night she was left down there and she couldn't breathe. Mm-hmm. She, like her wrists were hurting so bad from being in the chains and that and from hanging from the ceiling. Like, can you imagine just your whole body weight just being held up by your wrists? No, that's awful. So she was yeah. like, was she like a snowman with the middle piece missing? Like a big box no, and then another box? No, she was like sitting at, at this point. And okay. Had, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, and she said that there was like a little hole in the bottom of the head box and she kept trying to like maneuver her head down to get air because oh. she was like, she felt like she was suffocating in that. Mm-hmm. Finally in the morning, being exhausted because she was trying to stay alive all night, Cameron came back down, removed her from the crate in the head box, and he put her on a table, and he chained her hands and feet, like, to each corner. So she was, like, Aww. spread eagle, mm-hmm. on, still naked. Like, she's naked, like, this whole time. Oh. He then put her head back in the box and left again. Uh, just, just, yeah. Left her there. Yeah, just left her there. Like, he's just starting to, like, traumatize her and like, torture her. Torture her, day. like, yeah. mentally torture her. Colleen's roommates were 
like starting to get super worried. They knew that she didn't show up at her friend's house because her friend was like, where is she? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And like no one had heard from her. Her family was starting to get concerned. So like on the fourth day of her missing, her roommates filed a missing persons report. Good for them. Yeah. Good. So, but then a month went by and nothing. She's still missing. No one's heard anything. So her friends and family decided to get together and start their own investigation. They start, they like retraced her steps from her house and like the path that she would take to, to get, get to, to her Northern friends. California. Yeah. Okay. So in along the way, they filed a missing persons report at like each city. Mm-hmm. So her dad said that it was awful because they would just be driving and he would see farmland and like an old barn and he would wonder like, is she in there or not? Oh my gosh. Poor oh no. dad. So months started to go by and her family continued to call like the cops and everything for updates and nothing really, I don't want to say nothing was happening because I did read in multiple places that the cops were doing everything they can right. or they could, but um, like they just didn't have any updates. Like there's no evidence. Yeah, nothing. Like they literally, it's like she just disappeared. Mm -hmm. The family began to lose hope. Um, like at that time they were like, we're, we're probably not going to find her alive. Like it's been, oh. you know, while all of this was happening, Colleen was still locked up in the basement. She would be able to get an idea of what time it was throughout the day because of the temperature outside. Like she said, if it was like super hot, she knew it was daytime. And if it was cooler, then she knew like it must be nighttime right now because she's in that box. She literally is pitch black. Like it's that is terrifying to me when you're talking about the family like a month went by i'm just like thinking her in this box for a month yeah like she's been down here doing this so in in that first month she lost 22 pounds because he's like starving her he's using all types of like, torture, torture with methods. her yeah to get her complacent probably yeah he would take her out of the box every day for different methods of torture of course starvation was one he would regularly whip her he would shock her and he would stretch her using a homemade rack. Stop it. Yes. So I had to look up exactly what a rack was. It is a torture device. It's like a rectangle, like a table pretty much, with rollies at both ends. And like her wrists were tied up at one end and her ankles were tied up at the other. And he would use like something to slowly retract the chains that is terrifying and i've seen people like be tortured like in movies not in real yeah. life but in movies that's that's happened and it looks awful yeah and it was like the description was so like i was like i can't even read this anymore like of course it's excruciating pain um but like if you stretch a person too much you start to hear their like joints popping Ugh. and please stop like, that's i can't yeah i can't even so, and I'm going to post a picture of his, like, homemade stretcher, too. Um, because they have pictures of all of it, like, in evidence. And, mm -hmm. um, so he was starting to escalate. He started to, um, just, I just literally can't, like, he would control everything she was doing. Like, right. Like, when she could use the bathroom, when she could eat, when she could do everything. Mm -hmm. So it was like she had to start to rely on him for basic basic needs right yeah she became dependent on him she oh back to i forgot to say this about the the rolling thing she said um that she would be stretched so hard that her lungs would like lose air oh. like she just literally i'm just taken away by this stretching thing i just it's so crazy to me. She, of course, like, followed the rules because she had to live. Like, yeah. she had to survive. Mm hmm She did talk about, like, one of the things that really bothered her. He would bring, like, a bedpan in, and she would have to, like, urinate and defecate in front of him, and that, like, really bothered her. Yeah, I could see that, too. Like, your last moment of privacy. Yeah, and she's naked still. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you're just, everything is taken away. He had said to her one time, like, go ahead and scream. I'll cut your vocal cords out. 
and she knew that he was telling the truth. Like, she knew he was going to do that. So, she literally never screamed when he was torturing her. Like, she held all of this in. She is one strong woman. That almost killed me when I heard that. He said that she, she asked him almost every night, when are you going to let me go? And he would tell her pretty soon. Like, keeping her hope alive. Right. That he at one point intended to release her. Yeah. After several months of asking him that, she just decided to stop because it clearly wasn't going to happen. So after three months of captivity, Cameron built, like, a more permanent cage for her. He called it the workshop. And he would, like, give her jobs to do. And her first job was to, like, unshell walnuts. And this was also, like, the first time he had taken off the blindfold, too. So... I can't imagine being three months in, like, black and then all of a sudden, like, a blindfold coming off. Like, just... Being able to see around you and the light hurting your eyes. And just the shock of it. She was, like, starting to slowly earn privileges back. So, you know, she was able to work and do little things, keep her mind busy. After eight months... Eight months. ...in 1978, Cameron brought a piece of paper to Colleen, told her to read over it. He explained to her, and there's a Criminal Minds episode about this, and I didn't know it was real. Really? That he was part of an underground slave trading movement called The Company. So, according to Cameron, it was like this all-powerful secret organization. There were, like, government people in it, law enforcement, uh, like, judges, people from the court system. And they enslaved women for fun and for profit. And he told her that they used, like, super high-tech surveillance to watch the slaves at all times, make sure they don't escape. If they ever did, that the company would come nail her hands to beams and leave her hanging there for days and then kill her family. Oh, my God. So, and of course, like, this is all... Because when I sat down and thought about it, I was like, I don't think I would ever believe that. Like, knowing what I know now and then someone... but I just cannot, I cannot, like, fathom myself in her situation. Right. To start believing. You know what I mean? Well, like, he's, like, all-powerful to her. Like, he provides yeah, her. He's providing nutrients, everything. You know what I mean? Everything's provided for. She, he only becomes, like, a god to her. Yeah. In some sense. So, like, the paper he brought to her was a contract for her to sign. Stating that she would be his slave for the rest of her life. Mm-hmm. And it said things on it, like... You can never wear undergarments. She had to preserve her body for his use only and that she was to fulfill his every desire. And she, there was like a time when she asked him, what if I don't sign this? And he said, if you don't, I will make you wish you had. So she ended up signing it along with Cameron and Janice. Yes. Janice is still like cool with this. She's, yep. So now that she was like an official slave, she had to wear a collar and she would be called Kay. They gave her a new name. She was never to look Cameron in his face or in his eyes. And she was never to speak unless spoken to. And she had to call him sir or master and call Janice ma'am at all times. Yes. That is awful. So since she agreed and has signed this document, he gave her a gown to wear. For the first time, she's gone almost a year with no clothes on. Gave her a gown to wear. And she was allowed to go upstairs sometimes. So mm-hmm. she was, like, earning more privileges. Right. Things like that. That must have been, like, a godsend to her just walking up yeah. stairs. Not being in that basement anymore. Mm-hmm. Janice told her once that if she took a step outside of the door, like, if she tried to escape, she may as well put a gun to her head. Because that's what's going to happen. Like, Janice was going along with it. Mm-hmm. The weird part is, like, like this dude's bondage slave is living, like, upstairs, like, being upstairs with his wife. Right. Like, can you imagine, like, I, that just, this whole, like, thing blows my mind. Like, his wife's just okay with this. Well, Another she, woman coming in. She got mad. She's oh. starting to get angry. Oh, okay. Um, because she didn't want Colleen in there. Like, she started to treat Colleen like she was the other woman. Like, this was right. her choice to be there and be a part of this. Started getting jealous of her. Yep. A couple months later, things took an even darker turn because Cameron went down, blindfolded and gagged Colleen, took her upstairs. He took her in their bedroom, tied her up on the bed, like to all four corners, spread eagle again, 
he got on the bed on one side of her and Janice got on the bed on the other side of her. And then all of a sudden, Cameron jumped on top of Colleen and started raping her. Once he was done, he took her back downstairs and locked her in the box. Janice was super pissed. Right. She probably never agreed to that. Yeah, like, she said the deal was that he could have a slave, and I'm going to go over this more, too, Mm -hmm. if she could have another child. What? He was supposed to save the sex for her. So, Janice, and I'm assuming, like, because of her, like, history and, and all that, she was, like, super submissive. Right. And he has been, like doing this to Janice for years since she was 15. Right. He would call her a whore and torture her like the same way he was doing to his slaves. Basically, he got like tired of her. Yeah. And she thought if he got a slave, she would stop doing it to her. Oh, gotcha. Like that was like the agreement. Like he'll do that part of it to the slaves Mm -hmm. and then he'll save like the sex and everything for her and like give her children. Probably too. Like she just had that baby. So she wanted like some distraction. Between the two, you know what I mean? That makes sense. After that incident, though, like, Cameron started forcing himself on Colleen all the time. Like, it became a normal situation. It, like, opened the floodgates for him. Every time Janice was gone, he would do it. And he was, like, always super careful and wore a condom so nothing happened. Right. A year after being held captive, Colleen had given up completely on the idea to run away. Like, she thought in her mind, like, I'm going to die here being their slave. Right. She was, like, starting to accept it. Cameron ended up, they ended up moving, and he moved his family to this new house, and it didn't have a basement. So, he, I don't know why I gasped at that. Yeah. <laughs> so, he constructed a new box that she could get into, and he kept it under him and Janice's waterbed. Oh, my God. Yes. Gross. He put a fan into, like, the side of it, like, one of those little, like, a little circle fan. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. So, she said, like, during the day, she would focus on, like, the humming from the fan. He also put a bedpan in there with her. She would have to, like, distort her body to get over to it. Yeah. That's what I was thinking. Like, there's no room under there. She'd have to, like, flop it underneath of her. Yeah. And he, like, she talked about, like, because it would get so hot because of the California sun and... He wouldn't change that bedpan, and it would just smell so bad inside of that box with her. She could also hear everything that was going on, like, on the bed. Mm -hmm. Everything they were doing. Right. Um, And that's when she found out herself that he was also, like, torturing Janice. Gotcha. Okay. Um, She literally, like, Janice did end up getting pregnant again, and she gave birth on that waterbed, and, like... Colleen was underneath of it in that box the whole time, like, listening. That My mind is blown. That is, why yeah. did he not take her to a hospital? I don't know. Okay. She heard the baby cry, like, right when he came out, and Cameron let Colleen out to see the little girl, the little baby girl that was born, and then he immediately put her back in the box. See, if I was Janice, I'd be mad about that. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, you just let, like, she's not part of the family. Like, you just let her out to see my baby and then put her right back in. Yeah. You know what I mean? I can see why she's getting mad about this now. That's true. I didn't think about it like that. Mm-hmm. Um, so he started giving Colleen more privileges again. She was allowed to walk around the yard. Wow. Like outside by herself. And she could go on 15 minute jogs around the neighborhood. Wow. But she was like so afraid of the company that she wouldn't run away. Right. It's so easy to be like, why wouldn't she just... But she, like, legit thought everyone she saw, like, the neighbors and everyone, were part of the company. Or that she was under this high-tech surveillance. Right. And he probably threatened her family and everything else, too. So, it was just, like... Yeah, that's... She mentioned that in her interview, that that was, like, one of the things that also kept her there. Because she didn't want her family hurt. Right. And I bet, I bet truly, she believed that he could hurt them. Yeah. I mean, yeah. You know what I mean? literally keeping her in a box. hmm So... Cameron had told the neighbors, um, like, you know, this lady lives with us. She's a live-in babysitter. So, he was, like, covering all bases. Like, no one thought it was weird when they saw her. They were just like, hey, You know, he seems incredibly intelligent. Yeah. He really does, which is scary. He's had a lot of time to plan this, it seems like. Mm Mm-hmm. He's meticulous. Yeah. No one 
literally not even the children suspected anything. Like, they were so used to this because they grew up with it. Like, here's our babysitter, and, like, she lives in this box. Yeah, I mean, they wouldn't know any difference. Yeah, under my parents' bed. Like, no big deal. He would let her sleep outside of the box sometimes, but chained up in the bathroom. He would put a chain, like, around her neck, and the other side of it would be chained to the toilet. Oh, my God. Yeah. And during this time, he gave her a Bible, and she started to read it and, like, learn about God, and that helped her pass her time, like, while she was, you know. So that was another thing, like, he's introducing, like, God to her and everything. So she's, she thinks, like, she's starting to... Believe he's a good person. Like, yeah. Like, this is all what it's supposed to be. Yeah. After four years in captivity. Four years. Yeah. In 1981, Cameron decided that Colleen could call home and tell them that she was able to come for a home visit. Yes. What? My mind was blown at this part. She told them that she was like a nanny for this nice couple that she met on the road. He told her, like, that the company had never done anything like this before. This was the first time... And they just, like, did a special approval because she was so good. Like, trying to so, make her, like, seem like she was just a very good slave. Like, she was the slave. first. Yeah, she was the exception. So, I mean, he was just, like, thriving on this path. Can you imagine? No, like, I just really can't. saying these things and, like, having a whole human, like, I just. Like, brainwashing her and giving yes, her Stockholm brain, Syndrome. Yes, that's exactly what it is. He told her that the company would be watching and she better not make one wrong move. Like, he told her they bugged all the phones, they would come in and kill her family immediately, and it would be all her fault. Right. So when they arrived at her family's house, she got out and she introduced Cameron as her boyfriend, Mike. Oh. Yes. Her sister, um, I watched an interview with her sister, said that, like, her nickname among her family apparently was Pudge. Not very nice, but... That is not very nice. Whatever. I'd be super offended. But um, her sister said when she got out of the car that day, she was anything but Pudge. She was, like, super skinny. Her clothes were not normal. Like, they said that they were all, like, hand-sewn. Like, I guess, Jan- I don't know if Janice made them, but she said they looked hand They really sewn. stay off the grid. Yes. Um, her hair wasn't normal. It was just, like, looking crazy. And it, they were just, like, super confused. Like, what is happening? Um, her her boyfriend, Mike, as they all thought it was, like, they were really confused about that because they said he looked like a bookworm, like a nerd, pretty much. And that was not her style at all. Wow. So, but overall, they were like, you know, whatever. Like, he's normal. He said hi. You know. He appears to be it's okay. Fine. Yeah. He literally only stayed for a few minutes, and then he left. So Colleen was alone with her family. Colleen spent the night with her family that night. He didn't come back until the next morning. So she was alone with them. All night. And didn't even say... Did not say one word. So they were, like, going through family, like, photo albums, and talked about everything she had missed. They didn't press her too much about where she had been. Because they were afraid that she would, like, leave again. Right. They were just happy to have her in that moment. Yeah. Her dad said that he thought, like, maybe she joined a cult. That's where my mind went. Yeah. Yeah. So, I'm not going to say anything. Like, you know, she's here visiting and that's all that matters. When she did leave, though, her family wouldn't hear from her again for three and a half more years. Oh, my gosh. This is... Yes. So, we're up to, like, seven years now. Yeah. So, Colleen assumed... Like, she's, you know, been good. She got this home visit. Like, things are going to start to get better. better. She's going to get more freedom. Mm -hmm. She was wrong. He locked her back into the box immediately, and he started to leave her there for 23 hours a day. Her treatment went back to how it was in the beginning. Like, he started to torture her when he would have her out, you know, when he did have her out throughout the day. And he moved her box into a pit. In a shed outside. Like, he dug, like, a dungeon. For her. Underground. Yeah, and, like, put her box down there. And, like, that's where she started to stay. Man, who taught this man this stuff? I don't know. I mean, you had to be, like, trained on how to torture Apparently someone like this. Apparently those weird magazines that he had. Oh. Like, what was that? Maybe. That was so weird. hmm After seven and a half years in captivity, when Cameron was gone, Janice started to let her out. To let Colleen out of the box. Okay. 
So they were kind of like starting to, um, Jan Janice was getting a different perspective. Like after they were starting seven and a half years. Seven and a half years. They're starting to bond a little bit, probably like with that same yeah pain that they're feeling. They have pictures together, like Janice and Colleen and the kids, like just all smiling, like they're a family. Wow, that's super so there creepy. There's also a picture that they took when um, Cameron went and picked her up from her family's house, where they're just like all hugging on each other and like big smiles. It, that comes up. She learned to fake it. Yeah, that comes up again. So. When Colleen was out, when Janice would let her out, they would read the Bible together. And, you know, they were starting to bond, like mm -hmm. we were talking about. Um, Cameron also started to allow Colleen to sleep on the living room floor. Okay. Um, so, this blew my mind, too. He then allowed her to get a job. What? Yeah. So, she got a part-time job at, like, a local motel. And her and Janice would go to church together, and she starts to see Colleen as, like, a sister wife, almost. Okay. I could see how so, that could start to happen. Yeah. After so seven because and a half years. Colleen's, like, she's around her kids and everything, and so mm -hmm. they're starting to, like, really bond. And Colleen's probably, like, really good to her kids, too. Yeah. Janice starts to talk to her pastor. Like, not telling him, like, we have a sex slave in our house, but... She explains it like it's a love triangle. Oh, okay. The pastor said, God would never approve of something like that, and you need to get out immediately. And for some reason, like, something flipped in Janice, and she went straight to Colleen's work and was like, you need to sit down. Like, I need to tell you something. And she pretty much told her everything and that the company was not real and everything was made up. Like, the slave contract... It's all made up. Like, all of this has been a big lie. Wow. What happened with her? Yeah. So, Colleen was like, I'm sorry. <laughs> what? What? And she, I mean, she had to be thinking, like, why did you let this go on for so long? Like, right. it's been, like, almost a decade, and you're just now telling me. Like, we're going, like, to church together and everything, and now you get a conscious about this? Yeah. Maybe she just found some independence with it. Like, he wasn't messing with her as much, so, like... She became, like, more empowered, confident, empowered and, with it. Yeah. Or got older and just started realizing things, like, because she's, like, and a she mom. she has daughters. Yeah, like, she has daughters. She's a mom. Yeah. You know what so. I mean? And then she's probably starting to think that he's going to turn on them soon. Yeah. That would be good through my so head. That's scary. The next day, while Cameron was at work, Colleen called him and said, I am in control of my life now. And I'm waiting on a bus, and I'm going home. Okay. There was nothing he could do about it. And she said that he literally bawled like a baby. What? Like, Please don't leave. Yes. 2,634 days was how long she was in captivity, this... being oh tortured God. every single day. She was finally free. She got on the bus almost eight years. She went home. She told her family about everything that just happened, like what was going on the whole time, but she didn't want to call the police. Okay. She, like in her mind, she wanted all of this to just go away and right. put behind her, and she just wanted to kind of like move on with everything. She was grateful to have her life back at that yeah. point. And also Janice was like begging her not to call the police. She said that Cameron could still change, just give him a chance to end like time to reform himself. So Janice was like begging her, like, please don't call the police. I know that he did this, but. Right. But don't take my, like, don't ruin my family. Yeah. Even though she ruined her life. Yeah. She was still, her and Janice were, like, of course, still talking on a regular basis. So, a few months later, like, as Colleen was, like, starting to get her transition going and she was, like, starting to, you know, feel more comfortable, Janice called her and said she was leaving Cameron and some people were going to come talk to her, and she, she needs to tell them. And then she hung up the phone. What? Yes. So Janice had finally gone to the police. Like, she broke her silence. She told them. What had happened? What had happened. Wow. So she told police that her husband had kept a woman in captivity for almost eight years, and she wasn't the only one. He also kept another woman and ended up killing her. Do so did... Colleen just didn't know there was another woman? So, okay, we're going to talk about I'm it. I'm sorry. Okay, go ahead. The detectives were, of course, blown away because apparently this is, like, a small town. Like Right. They see him all the time. Yeah. They're average. Yeah, community member. Yeah. They're very average. 
Janice told them that they had abducted another woman 16 months before Colleen. Oh, wow. Marlis Spanicky. She was 19 years old. And they did it in like a similar way. They picked her up hitchhiking, drove her to her destination. And when she was getting out, Cameron grabbed her and forced her back into the car. This time, while waiting for it to get dark, they literally stopped at a restaurant and went in and ate dinner while she was in the car. In the box. They are so confident in this. Yes. When they got her home, he wasn't able to keep her quiet. So he decided that he was going to cut her vocal cords when she started to do this. This is when Colleen kind of realized, like, thinking back, like, he told me if I wasn't quiet, like, he would cut my vocal cords. And, like, he had done, like... He meant he it. Really He'd done it before. It. Like, he said that because he had done it. Right. When he started to, like, do that process, like, cut her vocal cords, though, he realized because he's a douche. Mm -hmm. Oh, wait. <laughs> I don't know how to do this. I'm not a surgeon. Yeah. That wasn't in the magazines of how to torture so, people. Yeah. So, he made, like, the decision to kill her. So, they wrapped her up in a rug and took her to the car they then drove to Highway 44, which is apparently pretty far away. Mm -hmm. And they found, like, a side road and got out and dug a grave and buried her. She's telling all this to the police. Is wow. What is telling to the police. She just broke. Yeah. So, she was, of course, hysterical and, like, losing control of her emotions. And the police were like, can you show us where the body is? Like, we need this. We need her body. Right. Um, and she, she said yes. Um, but they, they had their doubts because of his, like, if this was all true, like, he can have some, like, extreme control over her. Right. Like, they had doubts, like, is she actually going to show us where the body is? and it, Or is, is he going to interfere? Yeah. Yeah. Literally, like, she took them, but they never, like, they never found her still to this day. They haven't found the body. Oh, wow. So. Okay. They don't know if she just, like, can't remember or they think it's weird. A couple things, like, why would they drive so far away? Why would they? Um, so they had a lot of questions about it, um, but they do believe the story about what happened. Right. It, that's very detailed. Yes. Um, they also found a picture. I don't know if they had it on, if she had it on her, but. Um, this is what really made them think, like, she she might not, um, like, keep talking. Right. Um, if she was, like, 15 or 16 in the picture, and she was, like, bound up in a lake somewhere um, from what Cameron was when he was torturing her. At one point, he took a picture of it, and um, so she was young. So this has been going on for a really long time. Right. She's probably close to 30 by now. Yeah, and it came out, um, like, he almost drowned her. During right that situation so they assured her like if you help you will have immunity okay good so she did I mean, agree to testify against her husband i don't know how i feel about that good i know especially like with the first with, when he first murdered that girl i can see her like disassociating a lot from it so maybe she yeah. doesn't remember a lot of the details of it and it was also eight years ago and she's been through a lot of crap since then but she also watched all this happen. Yeah, that's... So, I can see it both ways. I like, can, too. She agreed to it. Like, right. she was like, if you give me a ch another child, like, we will do this. She was an accessory to murder. She, like, knew all of this was going on. But at the same time, like... She was just as tortured. Yeah. yeah. She was just as submissive from all the years of torture, especially at 15. Yeah, so, and the prosecution brought that up, too. They were like, we think it's ridiculous that she got off so easy. Mm -hmm. Like, she literally, it was like two seconds, and she was offered Immunity. this amazing deal. Yeah. Before even all the details came out. So, the other question is, would Janice have ever, you know, committed, like, a violent act like this if she had never, you know, met her husband? I don't know. I don't, I don't think so. Mm-hmm. Because you see how, like, the criminal justice system, even when people are victims, they still get prosecuted. You see that a lot yeah. with, like, prostitution and rings and things like that. And this is, like, a huge one. And right. And she, she didn't. So. Right. Yeah. They decided to turn to the other victim who was still living, Colleen Stam. So, the police said that when they were on their way to talk to her, like, they expected to find a this scared girl who would like barely look you in the face 
like hiding in, you know, someone who mm-hmm. you would, like what you would expect in your mind for someone who has just been through that. Like locked in a room in a corner somewhere. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that's just not what they found. She was like super outgoing. Um, and they said she seemed normal and they were like super surprised by that. Like she was nervous, like had her family there when she talked to him, but she did not seem like someone who just came out of a situation like that. Wow. This girl's strong. So strong. She told them exactly what happened, like in full detail, and it matched up with what Janice had told them. They then asked her if he had any other sex slaves, and she told them, like not that she saw, but he used to keep this picture of a young girl, and she said it looked like a school picture, and she described like what the girl looked like, and um, they realized that it was... Marla's. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, And then it like hit her. Like she realized the only reason that she stayed alive was because she didn't scream. She made that decision to not scream. Right. To comply. That's the only reason. On November 18th, 1984, they had enough evidence to arrest Cameron. They knocked on his door. He didn't seem surprised. I'm sure he expected this to happen. He literally said, okay. When they said you're under, and he was like, oh, okay. And he immediately wanted to talk to a, an attorney. So right. he didn't talk to them. He didn't, there was no, like, interrogation. I'm wondering, too, if he thinks that it's just about Colleen and, like, she'll cover for him. I don't know. He definitely you know what I mean? thinks that he's going to get away with it. Right, that Colleen's just going to be yeah. like, yeah, we were totally he boyfriend and girlfriend. Thinks, like, they're too scared to go through with this. Right. So police searched his home. They found everything. The bondage material, the head box, the stretcher, the dungeon pit that was dug up out in the shed. He didn't think to get rid of any of the stuff. He did not. He, like, like his, their egos when they're like this. Yeah, true. Because he really thinks that she's probably going to back him up on what he's saying. Yeah. People who hold people captive are just like a whole different... Level of manipulation. A whole different level. Mm-hmm. Like it... It just blows my mind. The evil. It's so evil. Like, everyone in the community was shocked, obviously, because he was average. Yeah. Average dude. Average. Average. Just average. <laughs> uh, the best part, I loved this. His prosecutor was the only female lawyer in the entire county. Yes. So. Love that. I loved it, too. I was like, she is about to get so much revenge. I bet... I bet he hated that. Probably. Hated he, it. <laughs> strong women. Yeah, that's probably like his biggest fear. Yeah. So the prosecutor, she said she was facing like two big hurdles. Was Colleen really being held against her will? Like, mm-hmm. yes, she was kidnapped. But after some time, like he let her out. She had a job. Like, was this her choice after some time? Right. She had to... Prove that he had like all this. He like she had to prove that, which right. is difficult. And at this time, the statute of limitations had run out. Oh my god! Yeah, which is so stupid. Why is that? That is so thing? so stupid. The second hurdle was Colleen herself because she was so detached and like, like I said before, like seemed normal. Like she hadn't just gone through this whole thing like she went through so much trauma she just tried to forget about it yeah there was no anger at all like where is the outbreak you know what I mean like Mm -hmm. no one could understand it and she was already back out and working and dating again oh wow so I'm sorry if you guys can hear my oh I'm sorry that's not my neighbor's truck that's just a four wheeler just driving down down the road in the city (laughs) um so yeah she was back out like working and dating so she was like Immediately, like, back out there. Um, when the trial started, Janice, like, told the courtroom that Cameron had been living out his sexual fantasies and, and desires on her since she was 15. Wow. He went as far as hanging her from the ceiling when she was pregnant. Yes. While oh, she was pregnant. Oh, my God, but she was terrified. So, because of this, like, she was tired of it, like we talked about before. So... She agreed to let him have a sex slave. Like, she was telling the court this. Mm -hmm. She said she witnessed Cameron hanging Colleen on multiple occasions and that she was kept in the box and only let out to eat or use the bathroom. And she knew about the company being a lie and never did anything. 
this is when the prosecution like basically stepped in like why is she getting to walk away like what is why is she walking away from all this colleen's testimony was the one everyone was waiting for obviously she did not cry the whole time no emotional outburst like nothing she was like factual and straight to the point like this is what happened she had accepted it a long time ago. Eight yeah. years. I mean, that is a long yes. time to adjust to a situation like that. And she's so used to bottling everything up. Like, right. you don't even scream when you're being, like, tortured. How? Right. Like, how you is that possible? You say mute. They even brought, like, the box into the courtroom and had somebody lay down in it. And, like, everyone was shocked because it was so small. And they were thinking, like, how did she not lose her mind, like, during this time? Mm-hmm. Like, how did she do this? She disassociated. Yes. You know what I mean? Like, so I can see why she has no emotions about this. I mean, 23 hours you're just laying there in the heat in this box every day. Yeah. I can't. Maybe she was had, like, some kind of fantasy world going on with you it. You would have to. Like, something to you preoccupy her really mind. Have to. So it looked like a slam dunk for the prosecution. Like, they were like, okay, like, we're really proving this. Until the defense produced love letters. <gasps> From before and after she had escaped. Whoa. Okay. Showing that they, like, potentially could have been in an actual relationship. Okay. Stockholm. I mean... So, not only the letters, but phone calls. Like, it was said that there were 15 phone calls from Colleen's residence to the Hooker residence. And a few of those phone calls were after midnight, and they were times when Cameron was there alone. Like, Janice had already moved out. And, like, talk to the police and all that. So, there's no way she could have been talking to Jamis. Okay. So, Cameron claimed that even though, like, yes, he kidnapped her. Yes, he tortured her. Uh, He lied about the company. Like, but their relationship changed through the years. He loved her and she loved him. Wow. That is what he said. She was brainwashed, so. Yes. That, mm. His ego to probably believed that she loved him. He probably, she may have believed that. Yeah, she may have believed that too. So, he also said that she was in a relationship with Janice and they would practice bondage on each other and they like came up with this plan to, because they wanted to be together, to get him out of the picture. Okay. So, this was just. Something made up that he made up in his mind. Mm Mm-hmm. The prosecution, though, brought in, like, their smoking gun, Dr. Chris Hatcher. He's a forensic psychiatrist. Okay, good, good. We're getting somebody in there. Yeah. So he was able to explain what happens when you are, like, in captivity, when everything's taken from you, um, and, like, what happened? Like, you're only getting your necessities from this person. Mm Mm-hmm. Stockholm Syndrome. Right. It's when you fall in love with your captor. So even though she doesn't have like chains on her, even still, or she's not in her box, like she's never really going to be free. And this is what the jury needed to hear. Like they needed a reason to believe like. Right. Like why is this, like everyone is admitted to the kidnapping and the torture. So why is she still doing this? Mm -hmm. So once they, you know, works that made sense to them. After five and a half weeks of testimony, the case went to the jury. And two and a half days of deliberation, the jury found Cameron guilty on 10 out of 11 counts. What were they? So, everything I kept reading said for the torture and... Separate incidents, like the kidnapping. I'll have to get the documents, but he was a violent sexual offender. Right, so... Okay, I could see that. They could not charge him for anything to do with Marliz because they didn't have a body. That makes sense. Okay. So, kidnapping, torture, rape. So, I'm Um, really... Why did it take them two and a half days to do this? I don't... I don't know. You know what I mean? It should have been, like, by noon. I can see, like, some confusion. Like, some people can be like, she... The, they were in a relationship, like, look at these love letters. Like, I can see where some people would have a hard time believing. Um, Colleen songs. at this point. Yeah. Okay. I still don't agree. I don't either. But he was found guilty. Um, Cameron was shocked, obviously. He didn't think that was going to happen. He thought he was going to get away with it. The judge sentenced him to 104 years in prison. Great. Good. He said, quote, 
he believed Cameron to be the most dangerous psychopath that he has ever dealt with. I could see that. Yes. Absolutely. No one has, Cameron's never talked about Marla's and where her body is. He probably will take that to his grave. Probably. As for Colleen, two and a half years after she escaped, she gave birth to a baby girl, Danielle. She is on her fourth marriage, and she talked in her interview about um, just the trauma that she had to go through and explaining that to people and having them understand. Um, I can't imagine what it's like to be in a relationship after going through something like that. Right, because she probably still in the back of her mind in some way, like, attaches him to her. Yes. And so... then and then also, you have just a mixed form of love in your mind. Yeah. Like, what you actually do, and then probably she freaked out if they did certain things with yeah, I can that see it. and like even with the men, like how do they handle someone? You know, they're gonna need um, like some type of therapy too to mm-hmm. see how to like better understand her, yeah, what happened to what her, happened and what's going on. Because they probably got confused too with like why was she still writing letters to him, or or if she could have like even spoke fondly of him at one point. Yeah, that and probably like her sexual relationship, her emotional mm-hmm. rela- like it is probably all it's messed up probably. Yeah. So, um, but she is like her fourth marriage. They're, you know, still married. Oh, and good. Doing well. I really want her to have a happy ending. So I'm I hoping know. this goes this way. <laughs> so she also has physical damage from all the torture. Like her hair is like super thin now. She has spine damage. Oh, from the, the rack? Yeah. The stretcher? I don't know if it was from the rack or the box. Yeah, true. Probably both. Probably both. Um, and she is on like a long term pain medication now. Right. Um, in 2015, Cameron Hooker applied for early parole. In California, because things have changed, they can't just go off of the fact of, like, this is what they did years ago. They have to prove also that they weren't a good inmate. They haven't changed. What? Yes. But he was ultimately denied parole. I don't even understand why that was even a question. Yeah. Like, he would immediately have gotten a new sex slave. Uh, instantly. Instantly. Like, on his way, you know, to the bus stop. Like, hey, girl, come with me. Yeah. Immediately. So, here's the crazy thing. There is a chance that Cameron could be released this month. Stop it. Yes, March 2021. The courts are in discussion right now. They're... Because of COVID. Stop it. I swear. The possibility of parole. Um, I read a few articles stating that they wanted everyone to reach out to, like, the California Parole Board and, like, voice their concerns for Cameron Hooker being released. Right. Um, I'm so glad also, you picked this one this yeah. month then. Because I want to yell at him, too. Like, what I are you know. thinking? Like, I had literally, I was, like, done doing my research. And I was, like, I'm going to look up, like, now. Like, what he's doing now. Right. And that popped up. And I was, like, What? There are also multiple petitions going around to try and keep him behind bars because he's definitely going to reoffend. Yeah, absolutely. Even I have no question. Old, no like question. He's going to reoffend. He is absolutely going to reoffend. So I can see him like, like, trying to like bring an escort home and already have this huge setup yes. being done. Even more access to people nowadays. Yeah, more access to like torture devices and. We definitely need to put these attached to the description, like the website you can go to. I de- I will, yeah. for sure. Um, and hopefully he doesn't get out. That's I don't ridiculous. Think he, I do not see him getting out, but just the that there's a chance is scary. It blows my mind. Why would... Yeah, so that's what... And, like, I didn't plan that at all. Literally, they were, like, this month, so... That happens all the time, though. Dorothea Puente, her... Uh, death date was on March 11th. I know. Like, it always just happens like that. So weird. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, hopefully that doesn't happen. Um, but I just thought this story was, cr- like, I didn't I didn't know about it, and it was crazy, and it, I just can't imagine. It just know. blows my mind, like, the capacity of evil someone can have yeah. like that. And Colleen... And Marliz, her sister, Mm -hmm. are both, like, fighting very strongly. Like, they show up at the parole hearings and everything Mm -hmm. to keep him, like... Behind behind bars. bars. And she's, like, a very open, like, victim's advocate and... Love um, that, too. Yeah. So, she's, like, super involved. And she's a grandma now. Like, she has a grandchild. Yes. 
So she's probably knitting somewhere. Probably knitting too, <laughs> but she, her knitting is actually legit. Yeah. Like it's good knitting. <laughs> so yeah, I hope that didn't like bum you guys out too much. I feel like I'm in like a low mood anyway today from doing the all research. the research about this. And I'm just like, I don't have like the capacity to like laugh and make jokes in this episode. Cause I it's know so it is tragic. Deep and just dark. Yeah. That guy, I mean, he didn't have like a mental illness, you know, a sad child. He just was pure evil. Yeah. He was just evil, an evil person. Yeah. I just. He better not get out. I, we will keep you guys updated for sure. Yeah. Um, I will. I'm definitely, we're going to be watching. I'm literally now. not busy next week. If we need to go to California. We will go to California. Like, let's go. <laughs> so, okay. Um. Yeah, like I said in the beginning, if you guys have any suggestions, recommendations of people you want us to cover, please send those to us. Um, we love it when you guys do that. And if you have any ideas for the website, let That'd us be great know that too. too. Because we are newbies. We're still trying to figure out how to podcast. And at the same time, <laughs> we're like, let's do a website. Like all of it at the same time. <laughs> yeah. So, And we're still going to work on the videos too. Mm-hmm. Um, We're just getting our grounds in this yet. I'm going to be honest. I feel like a lot of the pressure is because we're going to have to, like, get ready. Yes. Before we, like, we're just, I'm, like, in pajamas, pretty much. I'm just in leggings and a tank top. (laughs) And we're going to, like, have to put makeup on and stuff. Yeah, that's We've been working from home for, we don't, I don't even know how to put makeup on anymore. No. (laughs) So. And this is a permanent fixture in my life of how I look right now. (laughs) So, okay, yes. So, if you guys... Um, Yeah, go on our Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, um, anywhere that has podcasts, Apple, anything. Mm -hmm. Um, And we're really good at responding, too. We will absolutely respond, and we Mm -hmm. get excited, and we watch where the downloads are. Yes. So, Belgium, we see you. (laughs) Alrighty, we love you guys, and we will talk to you next week. Bye. Bye.